All right. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we're very excited to have uh, Benedict von Harlin here um, today to tell us about some recent work um, that that definitely caught my eye uh, when it, it came out and, and seems to use a, a lot of really cool ingredients that um, I, I would like to understand better. So I'm, uh, I'll be very happy to, to hear all about it. Um, Benedict, whenever, whenever you'd like. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm happy to be able to virtually give the seminar. Um, yeah, so uh, this work done in collaboration with um, Jan Cardo, Eduard Masso, and Mariano Kriers at IFAL, based on this paper, and also partly based on earlier work with Valerie Domke, um, Enrico Morgante, and QI Mukaida, who were at DESI at the time, I was before. Oh, sorry. Yes. So as you probably guessed from the title, um, I will be interested uh, in baryogenesis in this talk. And as you all know, I guess, um, for a successful biogenesis mechanism, uh, one should satisfy the, the Sakharov conditions. Um, one obviously is that you need barrier number violation, CNCP violation, and uh, yeah, should be some kind of out of equilibrium dynamics also involved. And um, one well-known example is electric biogenesis. Um, where uh, the B violation arises from Sphaleron transitions, there are CP violating phases um, um, that uh, give rise to CP violating interactions, and uh, the out of equilibrium dynamics arise uh, if the electric phase transition is first order. Um, in the standard model, of course, unfortunately, this doesn't work because the electric phase transition is 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 uh, a smooth crossover. Uh, and also the CP violating phases that um, uh, in the standard model, the CKM phases uh, are too small to give sufficient barrier in the symmetry, even, even if the first phase transition would be first order. Anyway, electric penetration, this is not my topic here. Um, I brought this up because um, I'm going to talk about something that is superficially related to or similar to electric biogenesis, um, but only superficially. Um, in the sense that um, uh, the baryon asymmetry uh, in uh, the mechanism that I will discuss will also be generated at the electric phase transition. Um, and there will also be some dynamics of the Higgs that is relevant. Um, but uh, in contrast to electric biogenesis, the phase transition will be a smooth crossover. Um, so we, we just assume the standard model, um, um, at least when it comes to the phase transition. And um, the dynamics of the Higgs, um, the relevant dynamics of the Higgs, take place at much earlier times, namely um, just after inflation. So um, just to give a quick, quick outline of the idea, and I'll discuss all these things in more detail. So the, the idea is to couple um, the Higgs doublet uh, that I know with capital phi here to the Chern Simons term of hypercharge. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that the Higgs should be somehow away from its late time minimum after inflation. So it should have a large expectation value. And then after inflation ends, the Higgs will relax towards the late time minimum, towards the origin of the potential. Um, and as I will discuss, this will lead not to the generation of a baryon asymmetry yet, but instead something that is closely related to that by the P plus L anomaly. Um, namely um, a background of helical hypercharge gate fields. Under certain conditions that uh, I will also discuss, these um, helical gauge fields will survive until the electric phase transition. And at that point only, they are converted into a baryon asymmetry. So we end up with a baryon asymmetry, and there will also be then some ordinary magnetic fields that could have some interesting observational consequences. Okay. So, so the outline of the talk is, yeah, first I will discuss in some detail um, how the cybermagnetic helicity um, can be generated from a relaxing Higgs, assuming that we also have this coupling. Um, then I will jump ahead to the electric phase transition and describe how this helicity can generate um, a baryon asymmetry. Um, 
then I will take a step back again to discuss under which conditions the solicity can survive between so the elicity is generated after inflation and should survive until the electric phase transition. And there are some conditions that we think should be fulfilled for the elicity to survive. Uh, then I'll discuss a simple model for uh, to, to get a large Higgs VEF just after inflation uh, and also some results for benchmark points. I'll comment on the magnetic field today if there's time left and then I'll conclude. Okay, so the idea is, as I already mentioned, um, that we have a coupling of the Higgs doublet um, to the uh, transcendence term of, of, of hypercharge, so y, y tilde, the y is the field strength of the hypercharge gauge boson, of course. Um, and capital M is a mass scale that um, will be specified later. Um, and in case you're interested um, in the appendix of our paper, we have a UV completion how to generate this, but I mean, it's just one example. So I'm sure there's plenty of possibilities to generate this term. I should also say that uh, in principle, there could also be a coupling to Y squared. So the kinetic term of the gauge, hypercharge gauge field. Um, and actually in, in, uh, in the UV completion that we have in our appendix, this would also be generated generically. Um, so I, I think that, I mean, the, the production mechanism is quite sensitive to the value of this parameter capital M. Uh, so if this, if this coupling to Y squared is a little bit suppressed, maybe by a factor 10, I believe this would already be enough to make it completely inefficient, which in our model would require some mild tuning. But in any case, so, so um, for this talk, I will only focus on this coupling and I will not consider coupling to, to the, um, kinetic term of the hypercharge gauge boson. Okay, so the Higgs, as I said, we assume the Higgs is uh, away from, from, has a large VEF after inflation, and later I'll describe how this can be achieved. Um, so then we are in the broken phase. Um, and um, so, uh, so then we should go to, to a different field basis. Um, so this coupling will give rise to a coupling to the photon and also coupling to the Z boson. The Z boson is very heavy because of the large Higgs VEF. Um, so again, we expect that um, the production uh, of Z bosons will be very suppressed and we focus on the coupling to the photon. And little h now is kind of the, 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 the Higgs field on the, the component describing the VEF, right? Um, okay. So, um, Okay, now in order to describe how this, um, how like a, a moving Higgs generates, um, 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 yeah, generates magnetic helicity, um, I will quantize the gauge field. So I'll decompose it like this, where A is uh, some annihilation operator, um, epsilon is some polarization vector, and uh, most importantly, lambda is helicity, which can be plus one or minus one. So two helicity states, of course. And a lambda are the mode functions. Okay, so plugging this into the equation of motion for the, for the photon, um, including this coupling, of course, I end up with uh, an equation of motion for the mode functions, which takes this form here. Um, and so the crucial point is the the interaction, this coupling to, to, um, to the Chan Simons term of the, of the photon um, has went into this parameter Xi here that I've defined. Um, I notice that this parameter Xi now depends on the, on the time derivative of the Higgs F. So whenever the Higgs is on the move, this parameter is non-zero. And, and then you see what happens is that um, for a given sign of so let's, let's assume Xi is positive, then lambda is helicity, right? You see that for states with positive helicity and momentum smaller than Xi, there's a tachyonic instability now. Um, and this leads now to the uh, exponential production of, of, of these modes here. Um, for the opposite helicity on the other hand, so if Xi is positive for modes with negative helicity, there's no such tachyonic instability. Um, so now, if I if I manage to have dynamics such that the xi is somehow dominantly of one sign, um, 
either positive or negative, I will produce uh, a net helicity. So the helicity is just defined. So uh, well, helicity formula is like uh, the expectation value of A dot B, A times the magnetic field B. And then if you plug in the, the, the um, multi-composition, you see it essentially just counts the power in positive helicity modes minus the power in negative helicity modes. And then if there's more power, more power in one of them, then I have a net helicity. That's essentially. Um, yeah, and I should also say, I mean, quantities here in this talk are usually co-moving. So this is kind of the co-moving helicity, um, not the physical helicity. Um, okay. Okay, so we will assume. So um, again, this is probably a triviality, but why is it defined with respect to a magnetic field? Then, uh... um, well, I mean, we are on the broken face, right? So, so that's why we, I, I don't know. I mean, you mean why we consider the electromagnetic field instead of the hypercharge gauge field now? Is that right? Or no, no. My my question is uh, more basic than uh, than uh, I I understand the right hand side than uh, yeah. so the net helicity. Um, is it obvious why that occurred from the, the interior probe the, of with the magnetic field? Then um, I mean. Well, I cannot, I mean, it comes out, of course, but. No, okay, okay. That, I that's don't have any question for that. Yeah, I mean. That's a matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. It's I mean, I think, I think there's a, some kind of, no, I think there's some kind of intuition um, somehow counts. Um, I mean, it's about the intersection of flux lines, I believe, but yeah, I'm not. Um, okay, that's a matter. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so as I said, so we assume um, now we make a simplifying assumption, namely we assume that um, so the dynamics takes place after inflation and we will assume that there's some phase of matter domination um, while the Higgs is rolling down or moving towards, um, towards the origin and the helicity is produced. Um, and this is because we somehow uh, want to uh, be able to neglect temperature. Um, so the assumption is there's a phase of matter domination and we can neglect the temperature. And I will comment later on how well this is satisfied or not. Um, so then, yeah, then we produce this magnetic helicity. Um, then at some point the universe reheats and electric symmetry is restored. And at this point, this helicity is again transformed into or is transformed into hypermagnetic helicity now. Um, so you can essentially, uh, the, the photon will project now in the, in the unbroken phase onto the hypercharge gauge boson. So, so this will project onto some hypermagnetic helicity. Um, That's can, a can, I, can I ask one uh, basic question here? So it looks okay. like the total amount of helicity you produced will depend on the duration of the Higgs rolling down the potential and, and therefore exactly. the shape and then the initial position of the Higgs. Exactly, yeah. And would that be directly proportional to the amount of the symmetry eventually? Or? Uh, yeah, so the helicity is directly related to the amount of asymmetry that you get, indeed. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I will later, I mean, yeah, so it turns out that in order to make this work, you need quite a large initial Higgs wave, larger than the inflation scale, which causes some problems. So, um, oh, okay. Okay, I will just yeah. wait. Then. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. so, but, but this will come later. So, I first wanted to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I should also say, I mean, essentially what I discussed now in the first few slides is quite generic. So, I mean- Sorry, this is during, during the inflation? This is a... No, this is after inflation. So, so we are essentially assuming that the Higgs is not really moving um, during inflation. I mean, in the model that we have, this will be fulfilled. Um, and then once inflation ends, somehow the, 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 the Higgs starts to roll. And so this side parameter is non-zero and then that's when the production happens. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so what I want to say is that kind of you could also, I mean, so people have looked at this in the context of axon inflation. So you can just replace the, 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 the Higgs uh, by the axion here. Um, um, and then you would produce, um, produce a solicity during inflation. So, so it's a different, different mechanism that uh, um, I've looked at in these other paper that I mentioned in the beginning. So, and what I'm discussing here in principle also applies to that um, until later, then I will focus on the Higgs. Um, 
Okay, anyway. So, okay, so now let's, let's, um, yeah, so now uh, as I already, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, now there is a connection between this uh, high homogeneity helicity that I've, that we have produced um, and um, a B plus L symmetry. And um, this becomes clear if you just look at the anomaly equation for the B plus L current is um, there's a YY tilde term. Um, there's also the term from the W bosons, but this will not play a role here for now. Uh, so I suppress this here. Um, so now you can take the, the volume average of both sides. And then you see that um, so on the left-hand side, you get just the term derivative of the B plus L asymmetry, B plus L charge. And on the right-hand side now, you get from this term here, the time derivative of the helicity. Um, so this implies that if you now change the helicity, so if the helicity would now decay, um, you generate um, a compensating B plus L asymmetry. So you can think of the helicity as somehow the same thing as a B plus L asymmetry, just like a different currency or so. So if you, if you decrease the one, then the anomaly equation tells you that you, you have to you have to uh, you have to decrease the elicity, you have to increase the B plus L symmetry. And this has been, to my knowledge, first pointed out in these two papers by Joyce and Shaposhnikov and Giovannini and Shaposhnikov. So one way would be to just, I mean, to just have the helicity decay um, um, during, during the evolution between, between uh, reheating and electric phase and later, I mean, due to some plasma dynamics, for example, this is actually not what we will do here. Um, instead, um, we will assume, and later I will give some conditions for this to be fulfilled, as I said, that the helicity survives until the electric scale. Um, okay, and then at the electric phase transition, what happens is that uh, now electric symmetry is broken again and the hypermagnetic fields project onto ordinary magnetic fields um, and also some Z bosons. Um, so now the point is that, um, so now again, I have the, the, the equation for the B plus L current and now I include the um, term from the W bosons. Um, the point is that um, now the, um, the photon, um, which carries the ordinary magnetic fields, does not contribute on this side because it does not contribute to the B plus L anomaly, of course, right? Um, um, the Z bosons, on the other hand, um, that the helicity also projects on, uh, decays quickly. So effectively, what this does, this phase transition, is um, that, yeah, effectively what happens, so now I can again write this, take the, uh, spatial average and get this equation for the B plus L current um, um, related to the to the helicity. So effectively, what happens at the electric phase transition is that this this helicity on the right hand side goes to zero because it does not contribute anymore. Um, so then you see that by this equation, the compensating B plus L symmetry is generated. Um, that is essentially the, the the basic principle of the mechanism. Um, oh. So, sorry, then isn't it that when you first produce non vanishing helicity by the rolling Higgs, yeah. wouldn't you then produce negative B minus L charge to begin with? Exactly, very good point. Yeah. Exactly, I will comment on that later. Yes, exactly. So, um, exactly, you produce. Um, um, I've, I've suppressed this here. Yeah, so you also produce exactly. So, essentially, at the point when um, when the, so after reheating the electric symmetry is restored, right? At that point, the, um, this is essentially the inverse of this process. You indeed produce a B plus L symmetry. But then of course, this asymmetry is, is, um, is erased by the tolerance. Um, right, uh, I see. But I mean, there is actually a condition that arises from that that I will discuss later um, okay. because it can happen. I mean, there's a process that uh, can endanger the elicity again, 
called the chiroplasma instability. Maybe you can, I mean, I will discuss this later, but yeah, oh. in principle, the, this asymmetry is generated, but then, then erased by this following. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, which asymmetry is erased by the following? I mean, so essentially, yeah. Not the V minus said, N. Um, the, the B plus. The so V plus the, L. The B plus L asymmetry, so there's one, there's B plus L asymmetry generated already at reheating, which is because reheating is really, you can think of it at the inverse of the electric phase transition, right? Um, but the phalaron don't touch this other one because... Uh, uh, yeah, I comment that on that in a second now, exactly. So okay. of course, you also have to worry about phalaron during the electric phase transition. So exactly. So okay, I'm to that right now. Um, I was thinking before the electro phase trend. Okay, continue, continue. I mean, no, so, so again, so there is, after reheating, there is helicity, hypermagnetic helicity, and a B plus L symmetry. The B plus L symmetry will be erased by this follow -ons. So after a while, I only have the hypermagnetic helicity. Right, okay, very good. Then comes, very good. Then comes the electric phase transition, and then the thing happens in the reverse again. So then, then I see. Very good. Very having good. Having it goes away, and I have I have a B plus L symmetry, but of course the uh, swellings are in principle still active, so I have to be careful. careful. Right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Very, very good. And this is what I'll discuss now. So the point is that um, that the that this this transformation of the Hypermagnetic helicity into ordinary magnetic helicity is a smooth process and not, not an abrupt process uh, as one might naively think during the crossover. And the point is that, um, that the thermal corrections, um, so that the gauge bosons during the crossover not only get masses from the Higgs path that, that slowly develops, um, but also, they also have thermal masses. The W bosons have thermal masses. Um, and this means that, um, so initially at, at, at temperatures somewhat higher than the electric scale, um, the thermal masses, um, the thermal masses still dominate. Um, and the, 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 um, electric symmetry is still effectively unbroken. And if I cool down, um, then at some point, um, the Higgs wave becomes larger and larger and starts to dominate over the thermal masses. And that is when the symmetry is more and more broken. I mean, in the sense that, so I can, I can, I can quantify this by defining a temperature dependent uh, weak mixing angle. Um, which is essentially the projection of the of the um, hypercharged gauge boson uh, onto the photon, and at high temperature. So this is now this plot here shows some lattice simulations of this temperature dependent weak mixing angle as a function of the temperature, and at high temperatures, um, yeah, at high temperatures. I mean, it's a very messy plot, but uh, but you see at high temperatures, um, roughly the weak mixing angle is zero, and then. If you go down, it starts to grow, and then, oops, eventually it reaches the value today. But yeah, it's a smooth transition. Um, okay. So and yeah, okay. Let me continue. Um, so so the way the way this can be described now. Um, so again, I have the anomaly equation here. Um, I've heard it before, but but now, um, okay. Again, it gives rise to to um, some evolution equation for the B plus L symmetry, and now this this um, this um, yeah this this smooth uh, transformation of the um, of the hypermagnetic fields into ordinary magnetic fields, which essentially leads to a smooth decay of the have a magnetic helicity on this side of the equation, I can describe by the time derivative of this um, of this temperature dependent Weinberg angle. Um, 
Okay, and then uh, of course now uh, uh, I also have Svalerans um, that, um, so this acts like a source term for the B plus L symmetry, but then there are also Svalerans which, uh, which um, lead to the decay of the B plus L symmetry. Um, so the point now is that, that um, the, the source here um, is typically still active when the weak sphalerons have already frozen out, they freeze out at temperatures uh, around 130 GV. Um, and at that point, this source is not yet, I mean, still active. So there's still um, a little bit of, um, yeah, still some, some left. Um, and this leads to, uh, yeah, this leads to some finite P plus L symmetry that can remain. This was uh, analyzed in detail by, by Kamada and Long in these two papers here. Um, okay, ju just to understand the picture. Basically, you produce initial uh, helicity in hypercharge, and then there's a two competing process. One is diluting it by the smaller process. The other is leaking into the electromagnetic uh, exactly. helicity. And you're saying that leaking is efficient enough that you don't lose everything from the sphalerons that are washing out? Exactly, exactly. So the, the, the sphalerons essentially freeze out at some point, around 130 GV. Um, and then at this point, the source is still active. So, so you still get a little bit of B plus L symmetry, which, which um, can be enough. I see, exactly. thanks. Okay. So let me see. How, okay. Okay, so um, so far as I, I as I said, I uh, I have just assumed that the silicity um, survives, does not decay between reheating and the electric phase transition, and now we'll discuss some conditions for this to be fulfilled. Um, and this unfortunately in involves some some um, for me somewhat. Um, um, yeah, some messy, um, some messy um, magnetohydrodynamics. So, um, so the point is that that um, the hypermagnetic fields. Um, so now we are again back after reheating. Um, the hypermagnetic fields um, start to interact with the thermal plasma, um, and um, because the plasma is charged, they, they um, start to put the, the, the plasma into motion. Um, now this motion then in turn back reacts um, on, the, on the hypermagnetic field. Yeah, and this is described by, um, by field, by magnetohydrodynamics. Um, and the relevant equations are Maxwell's equations and the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, so in a, um, yeah, so, so um, in our case, um, the one can show that the- right, is, there, uh, is there something parameterized the fact that the, some of this will just decay? Uh, sorry? Uh, could you repeat this question? At, at, at the electric phase transition, some of these, uh, a component of, of a hypercharge becomes massive, right? So it, 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 will, it will just decay. Exactly. So yeah, this is what I was said before, right? So, but, but is there is there something in the equation telling me that uh, it will, will, will decay? In the equation uh, here, you mean in this equation here, or in the equation on the next page? I mean, this is this is now, this is during, um, I mean, this is in the unbroken phase now, right? So so, this is between reheating. Yeah, what I'm describing. Describing is between reheating and the electric phase transition. So, yeah. so even the, even in the unbroken phase, right? So, is is, are you, is the temperature much higher than the electric weak scale? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so I mean, we are we are. So, I will I will specify later. So, we start at temperatures of order ten to the fourteen GV, right? Um, that's kind of the reheating and, temperature. And, and, and your your Higgs uh, is is rolling. Um, well, at that point, um, I mean. Yeah, once reheating happens, we assume that the Higgs is essentially in its minimum, um, or at least um, the temperature is larger than the Higgs FF, so that we can. So, so, so the, the, this term mu five is is that the proportional to the rolling of the Higgs? No, no, no. So, so this this is yeah. I will I will discuss this now. So mu five is uh, proportional to um, to the fermion asymmetries that um, are also generated together. We see. We see hypermagnetic fields um, 
essentially, uh, yeah, this B plus L of symmetry that is generated initially. Sorry, the, 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 the picture is the helicity in the, in the hypercharge field is generated by, by some uh, er, earlier episode where, where the Higgs rolling to its minimum. Exactly. So exactly. And now what I'm now discussing on this slide, I just assume the helicity now. And now I'm worried about whether it survives the interactions with the thermal plasma or not. So, so this is this is after the production process, after heating. And now, yeah, the 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 upper magnetic fields that I have at this stage interact with the thermal plasma, um, and there are now some processes that can lead to the decay of the helicity or um, can ensure the survival of the helicity. And this is what I want to discuss now. At this point, we can believe you anything, right? Because uh, this is, as you say, very complicated. And yeah, so uh, again, I mean, yeah, I, I try to make it quick. So, um, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, to some extent. No, no, no. It's not a. It's just not a, not a criticism. It's just that. Uh, yeah, yeah. To I mean, but I. I hard to get an intuition I, from. Me. Yeah. I I feel the same. So so it's very complicated physics, and uh, to some extent, um, I have to believe what the experts in the field say. So. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, let, let me let me briefly describe what what uh, the picture is. So. Yeah, so again, the, the thermal plasma and the um, high magnetic fields interact with each other. And this is described by Maxwell's equations and the Navier-Stokes equation. And um, um, in our case, uh, one can show that essentially the, the, the Maxwell's equation reduced to one equation for the magnetic field only. Um, you can express, yeah, so essentially the point is you can, you can neglect the time Two Maxwell equations to give you one equation for the magnetic field. Um, and then there's another equation for the velocity field. So dy is a magnetic field, v is a velocity field. Um, okay, so there are several terms here. Um, now, this is a term that uh, um, I was asked about, but actually, for now, I will just neglect this term. Um, um, this gives rise to this carry plasma instability, but I, I I will discuss it only in a few slides. Um, yeah, two important quantities here are sigma is the plasma conductivity, um, and nu is the plasma viscosity. So some parameters um, in in magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, so let's first um, yeah let's first focus on on the evolution equation for the magnetic field. And I neglected the third term. So um, now there's, um, so now if I denote the correlation lengths of the hypermagnetic field um, as parameter lambda by, so there's a typical wavelength on which the magnetic power sits. And later you will also see that. Um, I can make some rough estimates of the sizes of these terms in terms of some typical amplitude of the magnetic field. Um, some typical amplitude of the velocity field and this correlation lengths. I mean, essentially just you replace the derivative by, by one over the correlation lengths. Um, so now there's this parameter called the magnetic Reynolds number, which gives the ratio of these two, um, two estimates. And if the magnetic Reynolds number, so just combine these two, um, is bigger than one, um, this this velocity term, I mean, this velocity dependent term here um, dominates, is larger than this term, which uh, describes magnetic diffusion. So it describes the decay of the magnetic field. Um, and if this criterion is satisfied, then um, there's a possibility, and I will be more concrete on the next slide, that um, the uh, helicity uh, is preserved by a process which is uh, called the inverse cascade. Um, and to get a hint of this, you can look, you can derive evolution equation of the helicity. Uh, so you take the derivative, time derivative of this quantity a dot b, and then you use this equation, and then you essentially get this expression. And the thing to note is that the velocity field has dropped out of this, uh, this, uh, 
of this equation of the right hand side. So the, the lesson is that the velocity field um, does not by itself lead to the decay of the helicity. It's only this diffusion term. And if this magnetic Reynolds number is bigger than one, the dynamics is dominated by, by this velocity field dependent term. Um, and so um, there's a possibility that um, the helicity survives. Uh, and this has actually been um, numerically um, well studied and verified. Uh, I think there are many papers by now about this. Um, in a case where another Reynolds number, the so-called kinetic Reynolds number is big. Um, so the kinetic Reynolds number measures, again, the relative important of um, the first two terms on the right-hand side of the evolution equation for the velocity field. Um, okay, I, I, I think I'll, I'll yeah, I, I think I abbreviate this a bit here. Um, so the point is, um, we unfortunately find that this kinetic Reynolds number in our case is typically less than one. Um, and this, this has, uh, two consequences. One is that, to the best of my knowledge, there is no numerical simulations with in this situations where, where you have a large magnetic Reynolds number and a small kinetic Reynolds number. Um, um, yeah, there's no numerical simulation, simulations of this case. So, so um, we cannot know for sure if the elicity, uh, if this criterion is really sufficient to ensure the survival of the helicity. Um, another consequence is that, um, so, so essentially from this equation, you can make an estimate for the velocity field because the velocity field is, is um, I mean, the plasma is set into motion by the magnetic field. So you can just by comparing terms on the right hand side here, you can make an estimate for the velocity field. Um, and the velocity field in turn you need for the evaluation of the magnetic Reynolds number. Um, and it turns out that in this, in this regime where the kinetic Reynolds number is less than one, the velocity field is smaller, which means that the, kinetic, the magnetic Reynolds number is also typically smaller. So it's, it's harder to satisfy this criterion uh, on the magnetic Reynolds number. Um, okay, anyway, so um, what we will impose really um, with a caveat that um, this is uh, not yet backed up by numerical simulations, but what we will impose is that this magnetic Reynolds number that I can now just express in terms of the, this is essentially the magnetic, yeah, this magnetic field squared, this is a correlation length. Um, these are all quantities that I know, so I can, I can now calculate, calculate this magnetic Reynolds number and, and check if it's bigger than one or not. Um, Okay, yeah, so as I said, there's no numerical simulations, but we, we talked with MHD, magnetodynamics experts, and they said that it's a reasonable assumption. So this is all I can. Um, so, sorry, can I, can I build up some intuition here? So my, my feeling is that in addition to the Spalaron process, which is one of the important washout process, you can lose the initial uh, abundance by other washout processes, basically active interaction with the surrounding plasmas, or exactly. this magnetic helicity can just freely emitate, emitate it and it disappear from the thing. So basically you're trying to make sure that there is no other primary washout that gets rid of initial abundance. Exactly, exactly, exactly. very good, exactly, exactly that. So, um, so essentially this criterion, what we impose is to, um, yeah, is to guarantee that the helicity does not, does not diffuse away. Um, that is essentially, Exactly, as you said. OK, thanks. OK, and now we get to uh, the point that was uh, already raised, um, that I already briefly mentioned, that um, we, don't, we do not only produce um, ordinary magnetic fields. So now I'm again. Now I'm jumping again back. Sorry for jumping back and forth. I'm jumping back to the production process. Um, and the point is that, so during the rolling of the Higgs, we, don't, we do not only produce um, 
um, helicity, but also fermion asymmetries. Um, and um, so um, to describe this, let, let me just focus on, on right-handed electrons for simplicity. Um, and I can define a U, U1 uh, corresponding to chiral rotations of the right-handed electron. And then I can write down some conservation equation for this current. And the symmetry is anomalous. So there will be a contribution from FF tilde. And it will also be violated by Yukawa terms, but those don't play a role here. So I can ignore them for now. Um, OK, and now, again, I take the, the spatial average and I get an evolution equation for the, um, for the, um, yeah, for the right-handed electron asymmetry, if you want to call it like this. So essentially number density and right-handed electrons minus the number density of the underparticles. Um, and again, on the right-hand side, what appears is the time derivative of velocity. So from this, you see that when I, when I, uh, when we produce helicity, we also produce um, fermion asymmetries, in particular in right-handed electrons, but also in other, other species. Um, and yeah, so this has been, uh, for example, well studied in the context of axon inflation, for example, by my, by my collaborators in these two papers here. Um, um, yeah. But um, in principle, it's really just this, this equation here. Uh, it's actually quite, yeah, I should mention it's actually quite nice. So you can, so um, the way this can be understood is that it's, it's, it is just the Schwinger, Schwinger effect in an electric and magnetic field. So you see that um, you can express the time derivative of velocity again, you can write it as E dot B. Um, so once you have electric and a magnetic field together, um, um, you have some kind of modification of the Schwinger effect, which leads to the um, production of this asymmetry here. And there's actually, so you can actually now, just by studying the Schwinger effect in an electric magnetic field, you can derive this equation. So you can derive, essentially you can derive the anomaly equation from this. Uh, I found this quite pretty. Um, okay. So, yes, so there's now, there's now, also the fermion asymmetry, the fermion asymmetry is generated together with the, uh, with the helicity. And this has two effects. Um, one is that um, the fermions uh, are now accelerated in the electric and magnetic fields, leading to a current which can um, back react on the production of the helicity. Uh, I will comment a bit later on this, but I don't have much to say about this, unfortunately, because it's a quite complicated process to evaluate. Um, yeah, and the other effect is this so-called chiroplasma instability that I discuss now. Just check. Okay. Yeah. So um, this chiroplasma instability. Um, again, it's 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 always the same story. I'm <laughs> again looking at the anomaly equation now, or at the equation for the charges that follows from the anomaly equation. Um, and essentially what this equation tells me is that I can convert helicity into charge asymmetries or vice versa, right? Um, so it's not surprising that if I have a charge asymmetry, I can also, I can go, so be, before I always discussed the, the conversion of helicity into charge asymmetry, but there's also the inverse process, um, the conversion of a charge asymmetry into helicity. Um, and this goes by the name of chiroplasma instability. And I think it was first pointed out in this paper by Joyce and Shaposhnikov. Um, okay, there are some, some, some simple scaling arguments that I will skip now, which show you that essentially um, um, there is a gauge field configuration um, carrying equal amount of felicity. Um, um, yeah, essentially helicity that corresponds to, to a given charge asymmetry that has a lower energy. So there's an instability for, if I, have a, if I have a charge asymmetry, there's an instability for this charge asymmetry to be converted into, um, into helicity in the plasma. Um, okay, so, um, and this is a problem because um, this helicity has the opposite sign 
So again, I, 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 after, after heating, I have helicity and charge asymmetries. Um, but now the, the, the charge asymmetries can be again converted into helicity and the helicity that they generate have the opposite sign to the helicity that is already there. And so it would, would more or less annihilate the helicity that was generated. Um, so I have to ensure that this process does not happen. And of course, this process does not happen if all the charge, I mean, the charge asymmetries are erased by the spherons, but not all of them immediately. Um, in particular, the right-handed electron um, can only, I mean, the symmetry in right-handed electrons can only be erased by spheron processes by its coupling to the left-handed electron, of course. Um, so this can only happen once the electron you cover coupling goes into equilibrium. And this happens at temperatures around 10 to the 5 GV. So essentially I have to ensure that the chiroplasma instability can only happen, I mean, does not happen um, at temperatures above 10 to the 5 GV, because then at 10 to the 5 GV, um, all the charge asymmetry I erased and I don't have to worry about this process anymore. I hope this was, okay, here's a cartoon that maybe makes this a little bit clearer. So, um, so essentially, yeah, after inflation, the Higgs rolls and we produce um, the hypermagnetic helicity, that's a black line here, and charge asymmetries in particular in the right hand electron. This is this green, green line here. Um, okay, so now if the magnetic Reynolds number is bigger than one, then uh, we expect that the helicity can survive. If not, it would decay very quickly. So this is one condition. Um, and then yeah, there's this danger from the chiroplasma instability, which can, can convert this charge asymmetry into helicity with the opposite sign. So it would annihilate the helicity that is already there. So if this happens, this is like shown by these dotted lines, um, both the charge asymmetry and the helicity would go to zero and we would again be not left with anything. But if I ensure that, the, that this chiroplasma instability does not happen until temperatures of order 10 to the 5 GV, then all the asymmetries are erased and uh, I'm no longer, this process is no longer dangerous. Okay, so this will be the two, two conditions that like this magnetic Reynolds number bigger than one and the temperature or the chiroplasma instability uh, smaller than 10 to the 5 GV. That's the two conditions that we will impose. Um, sorry. I, I I have a question. So there seems to be, so from a point of view of a change of uh, H, Y, both phaleron and chiroplasm instability plays the role of uh, uh, washout. But there is a, another connection, which is phaleron also washes out, uh, gets rid of basically charge, charge asymmetry. Exactly. So therefore, on the other hand, if phaleron process is too fast, then it not only washes out charge asymmetry, but it will also wash out the uh, HY. So, so in a sense, you seems like you seem to be asking the spotting process just right speed that it is fast enough to wash out charge charge asymmetry, but not so fast that you also completely wipe out the HY. You know no, I mean the spotterons don't interact with the HY, right? So, so I mean the HY is protected from the spotterons, so I don't. Think oh, sorry. Difference. I meant the Q. I guess QY. Oh, sorry. The QB plus L. Yeah. So the well. Okay. So the so again, there's a QB plus L. So there's plenty of charge asymmetries. Here I focused on the one and right and electrons, but there's others, right, which overall add up to some B plus L asymmetry. Exactly. So and the spherons start to erase this B plus L asymmetry already quite early, right? Mm -hmm. And then essentially the asymmetry in right and electrons is the one that survives the longest. That's why I've singled it out here. Okay. Um, and I mean, yeah, so the, the, the spherons um, only affect this, right? So um, at this stage, okay, now the helicity can now, if it survives, now at the electric phase transition, of course, the spherons again start to erase part of the asymmetry that is generated. So there again, you have to be worried about the spherons indeed. Yeah. I right? see. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks. But I mean, that's kind of, yeah. So, but that's happening at a different temperature, right? So, so there essentially 
I mean, the point is that, that at the electric phase transition, you are close to the temperature where, where the sphalerons freeze out anyway, right? Because. Right, uh, right. So. Mm, um, thanks. Okay, so finally, I will talk about, um, about how much time do I still have? Yeah, okay. I'll try to speed this up a bit. Um, I will talk about um, how we induce, so now I'm jumping back again, and I'll, I will say how I induce a large Higgs wave, um, um, a large wave for the Higgs after inflation. Um, yeah, and I was actually looking for a, for a picture of kind of Peter Higgs on the beach or something to make this pun, but unfortunately, couldn't find anything. But anyway, um, okay, so, um, and I mean, I guess there are plenty of models to achieve this. Um, we tried to come up, I mean, we looked at some simple realization, um, which has two ingredients. Uh, one is that we couple the Higgs to the Ricci scalar. Um, and the other is that we also couple it um, to a new scalar. So our Higgs potential now capitalifies the Higgs coupled to the Ricci scalar, and there's a, a new scalar lullify which couples also to the Higgs. And the, the, the purpose of this new scalar is just to avoid the Higgs quad decoupling from running negative at large FFs, because we want to go to very large FFs for the Higgs, and in the standard model, the quad decoupling runs negative. Um, so there's instability, and that's, that's what we want to avoid. Um, and just to give an example, so for, oh, it's not 4 GV, it's 4 TV, sorry, this is wrong. So for a mass of 4 TV and, and these couplings, um, this is a parameter that we will consider later in our numeric examples. Um, yeah, this is a, a plot of the, of the running Higgs quad decoupling and you say, see that it's always stays positive. That's kind of what I want to show here. Okay. Okay, and so to give you um, to give you some some intuition or to get some intuition, um, what kind of Higgs waves we need for this mechanism to work, um, I, I write here this uh, expression for the magnetic Reynolds number uh, that after all we want to be bigger than one, um, and um, it depends on the energy density um, in. Well, now I'm again in hypermagnetic fields and the correlation lengths of the hypermagnetic fields after heating now, now this is after heating. Um, and the correlation lengths is in our mechanism is of order the, the Hubble scale at the time when they are produced. So there's not much I can do here. Um, yeah, and the, 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 the Hubble scale, um, um, because it happens after inflation, is close to the inflation scale, which we choose to be 10 to the 13 GV, um, which is close to the biggest value that you can have um, that is still consistent with, with the Planck measurements. So you can also not really gain anything here. So what you have to do is you have to make this energy density in the hypermagnetic fields to be much bigger than the Hubble rate to the fourth power to compensate for the small prefactor that you have in front here. Um, so that in overall, you can satisfy this criterion. Okay, and then it's essentially, essentially just, just energy conservation. I mean, the, the energy in the hypermagnetic field arises from energy in the Higgs after all. So this tells you that you need a Higgs wave, which is much larger than the inflation scale, um, just to get some intuition. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so if the Higgs wave is very large, the mass of this scalar field phi is very heavy. So it's just a spectator field. I don't have to worry about it. And I can just reduce my X potential to, to, um, to this coupling to the Ricci scalar and the Higgs quad decoupling. Um, can I have a few more minutes or uh, shall I? Yeah, yeah, we've been uh, asking lots of questions, so. Um... So, yeah, yeah, five yeah. minutes or so. I mean, I think then, yeah, yeah. Mm. because, okay, good. Um, okay, so I have, I have, this is essentially the potential now that I, that I consider. And uh, now the point is that, that the Ricci scalar has some background value, right? Um, and this 
now the sign is chosen such that this coupling leads to a tachyonic mass term. So the, the Ricci scalar um, during inflation now, for example, is given by this expression here, H inflation is the hover rate during inflation, um, and epsilon is the slow roll param parameter. Okay, and then you see, then you, you minimize the potential and you see that, that um, because this induces a tachyonic mass term for the Higgs, the, the Higgs um, potential has a minimum, um, which is given by this expression here. And, and we assume that the Higgs is somehow in this minimum during inflation. Um, so you see that, I mean, so as I said, we want this, this this minimum, the initial Higgs have to be much larger than the inflation scale. Um, now, the fact that the Higgs quality coupling is small helps a little bit, but unfortunately it turns out it's not enough. And what we have to do, and I don't like this very much, but um, what we have to do is we have to go to moderately large values of Xi of the order 10 to 100, um, which yeah, I don't find pretty, but um, um, it is still much smaller than what people consider in, uh, in Higgs inflation, for example, where they consider values of order 10 to the four. I don't know if that makes it better, but yeah, <laughs> anyway. Could, could you go back to the, to the expression the, of the action, the Lagrangian density, the, 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 potential? Yeah, the potential, sorry. Yeah. No, no, the, the next time. The, the, uh, okay, yes. So, how do you fix lambda h? You fix it from the standard model and evolve it uh, to, to high exactly. so, so we, we fix it, yeah, exactly. It's a standard model coupling at low energies. And then we choose uh, the quantum corrections. I mean, the quantum corrections and from from the new scalar now avoid that it runs negative, right? So. Oh, 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 that is a point. So that the... Um, that disappoints. Okay. <laughs> so no, no, yeah, because I thought that lambda h, of course, has a zero at some point around ten to the ten, and then um, at ten to the thirteen, it would be negative. But but you say that uh, that you not. Uh, yeah, I mean, this would be, of course, then we would have kind of an abyss in the potential, right? We would so. I mean, this is why we introduce this new scalar to, to avoid this from happening. To avoid this. And then the question is, can you tune the, the new scale so lambda h is as small as you want? Then, uh... Yeah, exactly. We were trying. I guess you probably could. Um, yeah. I mean, I was. we were trying a bit, but, well, actually, no, sorry, it's not true because you also have the contribution from the beta function. So, so what I wrote here is not, I mean, there's actually the contribution from the beta function also here. And then... Uh, I, I don't think you can actually tune, I'm, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, great, very good. Yeah, very but good. I mean, in any case, you would have to tune, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not very natural. Okay. It's not good. very nice either, so, um, yeah. yeah. So I okay, think very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, so now there are a couple of options for the initial conditions that we will assume. Um, so, um, typically in single field inflation models, you just have the slow roll parameter to be one. I mean, it's typically taken to define the end of inflation. Um, epsilon equal one at the end of inflation. So you can plug this in here and get one value for the initial Higgs uh, But for example, in hybrid inflation models, you actually can have that epsilon is much less than one until the end because there's a second waterfall field that triggers the end of inflation. So these are two options that give slightly different parameters. Uh, here, I mean, it's not a big difference, but but uh, we nevertheless we consider these two options. Um, then another point is that okay, so now um, after inflation ends, we enter a phase of meta domination by assumption, right? Um, and during meta domination, the Ricci scalar is given by this expression here, um, and you see there's a there's a difference in the coefficient here. So it's six. Um, there's a minus three. Um, so yeah, and then afterwards the, the, so the minimum of the potential somehow now decreases, um, decreases uh, with a hover rate and, and, and this leads to the movement of the Higgs, right? So this is kind of the, the, the mechanism that, uh, lets the, the, that leads to the Higgs relaxation. The fact that this minimum now moves to the origin with the hover rate becoming smaller. 
so anyway, um, yeah, so as I was saying, the coefficient here is, is different. And now it depends a little bit on how fast the transition is between, um, between inflation and when you can describe things by as being matter dominated by the Ricci scalars given by this expression. Um, so there's, there's some kind of jump in the Ricci scalar here. Um, and um, so we just make to somehow um, to somehow uh, see the range of possibilities, we just consider two extremal possibilities, namely that there's a quick change in the Ricci scalar. So essentially during inflation, um, the Higgs is in this minimum, and then there's a quick change, um, which means that the, the, the initial value of the Higgs will still given, be given by this expression. Um, that's one option. And then there's actually two options because it could either be either be single field inflation or hybrid inflation. Um, or the third option is that the um, transition between these two regimes, the Ricci scalar is slow. Um, and then um, the Higgs has enough time to, to, to track this minimum. And um, so the third possibility is that the initial Higgs value is given by this expression. There's not a big difference, right? So it's just order one numbers, but but uh, they help a little bit. So just to get an idea of the of the range of possibilities, that's what we what we did. So okay. So now to make it uh, more concrete, um, we considered three benchmark points. Um, one, yeah, one is assuming the slow change in R. So this this um, giving this one initial value for the Higgs. The other is um, assuming single field inflation and a quick change in the Ricci scalar and hybrid inflation and a quick change in the Ricci scalar. And um, so this is a parameter sizes for this parameter non-minimal coupling psi r that we have chosen. And you see, I mean, 25 is the smallest, 150 is the biggest. Um, okay, this is the parameters for capital M. This is the initial Higgs valve that um, is fixed in terms of the, of the initial conditions. And the reading temperature is around 10 to the 14 GV. Um, okay, so now, now um, we can solve for the Higgs evolution. Um, and um, uh, this I've plotted here. So the, 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 the blue curves are um, the time evolution of the Higgs um, um, for point one and point three. Point two has a very similar time evolution as point three. So uh, I will not show it here. Um, and you see, so, so point one essentially has the feature that the Higgs never crosses zero really. It, it just tracks this, this minimum, uh, just follows this minimum. Um, and in, in purple, I've plotted the, the, this instability parameter Xi, and you see that it's, it's always, it's one sign. Um, so here it's, it's very obvious that you produce a natalicity. It's a little bit less obvious here. So, so for point three, um, the Higgs um, oscillates through zero, so this blue curve here, um, which then uh, leads to this parameter instability parameter Xi, um, also to change sign. Um, but, but nevertheless, you find, you're gonna see in the next slide, that you still produce a natalicity because essentially the natalicity, uh, I mean, the dominant contribution comes from the first oscillation here. Um, Okay, so yeah, just to okay, so this is this is uh, the results um, for these three benchmark points. Um, here I plot the the helicity, so you see kind of the helicity is slowly building up, and then reaches a plateau uh, in both cases. And the fact that it reaches a plateau is 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 uh, um, is clear from the fact that that um, so at late times when the Higgs evolves very slowly. Um, the electromagnetic fields that, that have been produced are essentially free electromagnetic fields. Um, and yeah, and, and, and they, they, they lead to a constant helicity. So you can show that I mean, essentially. Okay, anyway, here's a, here's a um, spectral densities. Um, so can the power of helicity versus, versus um, versus the momenta, um, yeah. And 
Okay, and in this table here, um, we have all the quantities that we've calculated. Um, so um, to note is this, again, this, this magnetic Reynolds number. Um, so for 4.1, you see that it's actually much, much less than, than, than two. Um, so uh, um, you actually do not expect this point to be viable. We've included nevertheless, because uh, it could be that, I mean, these were very rough estimates, right? Um, and um, in particular, our estimate for the magnetic Reynolds number is based on an estimate for the velocity field. Um, and yeah, I mean, so you can you can make you can make this a bit less less. Um, I mean, you can take out this assumption by by just defining some maximal magnetic Reynolds number, which just gives the 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 maximal velocity field that you that you can get from a given magnetic energy, assuming energy conservation. And then you see, I mean, so in principle, if the estimate for the velocity field is wrong, this could still survive. Uh, the other two are fine. The chiral plasma instability temperature is also small. Yeah, and this is this range for the for the um, for the barrier and the symmetry. And the fact that we have a range here is due to the essentially due to these uncertainties in the in the um, electromagnetic uh, in the in the electric crossover. Um, this this um, this lattice plot that I've shown before. I mean, the, the points were quite wildly distributed. So this leads to a large uncertainty in the in the time dependence of the of the weak mixing angle during the crossover, and this translates to a large uncertainty in the baryon symmetry that you have in the end. I mean, the point is that the observed baryon symmetry nine times ten to the minus eleven is included in all of them. And then you can play around with a with a reading temperature to to move it around a bit. So there's still wiggle room. Okay, so I think I'll I'll stop now. I mean, yeah, there's some some you have to worry about back reaction and final temperature effects while the helicity is produced. Um, but yeah, I will not say uh, much more about this. Um, there's also, I mean, at the at the electric phase transition, the hypermagnetic fields are again transformed into ordinary magnetic fields, so they are potential late time magnetic fields. Um, and there are hints for, for intergalactic magnetic fields from laser observations. But unfortunately, we find that uh, the magnetic fields that we produce are too small to, to explain the laser observations. So this is not okay. So let me conclude. Sorry for going over time. Um, yeah, so the helical hypermagnetic fields uh, can generate the baryon symmetry during the electric phase transition. We've imposed these two conditions on the um, to ensure that the helicity survives until the electric phase transition. And again, this is subject to some uncertainties. So to really establish these conditions, one should do some some dedicated magnetohydrodynamic simulations which uh, were beyond the scope of our paper. Um, yeah, we've considered a simple model to induce a large Higgs wave after inflation. Um, okay, and they considered three benchmark points uh, and found that the baryon symmetry can in principle be reproduced, but the uncertainty, uncertainties in all of this are quite large, so. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, let me clap for uh, everyone. Um, I. I have a question to to start just to um, uh, uh, make sure I have have things straight. Um, uh, lots of inner conversion going on, but um, so yeah. in the end, in the end, the, the baryon asymmetry you end up with is um, a result of having the helical uh, hypermagnetic fields during the electric phase transition, and then the the uh, the angle the weak angle rotating during that and producing the B plus L um, and then um, uh, the re uh, all all of the or, or much of the other uh, interesting physics you talked about was concerned with just uh, producing that 
uh, magnetic field primordially and ensuring that it, it actually stays there up until the electroweak phase transition. Is that the right way to yeah, think about exactly. it? Exactly, okay. exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, exactly, so mainly, exactly. Large part was, I mean, so for example, these two conditions here yeah, are to ensure that this helicity can survive, right? So that's kind of the, um, and exactly. So in the end, what gives the variance symmetry is this hypermagnetic helicity that uh, was, was produced. So, ah. Yeah, exactly as you said, yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, very interesting, yeah. Um, are there any other, Quick questions before we um, maybe take a, a couple minute break before chatting more. Was well, a lot of content, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 